Hi, David Harper, Bionic Turtle, kicking off a series devoted to the Chartered Financial Analyst or CFA exam, starting with an overview of the four basic financial statements. Here on the left, the most popular, probably, is the income statement, also called the profit and loss statement. And this example is for the year, the fiscal year 2011. So this is a flow statement, meaning it characterizes a period of time, typically a quarter or in this case, a one year period. And the important thing is that it recognizes trans transactions under an accrual, not a cash basis. So it's a period of time, one year. The top line here is revenue, also called sales. And so these are gonna, these are gonna get in per revenue recognition, not necessarily cash. Subtract the cost of goods sold, in this case 60, gives us the gross income, also called gross profit of 40. And then other income or expense, in this case I've got $20 in expenses. Deducted gives us the pre-tax income, we can also call that earnings before taxes. I've assumed 40% tax on those. And so if we deduct the taxes from pre-tax income, we get the net income which is also called the bottom line. On the face of the income statement, there will also be a couple of flavors of earnings per share. Here I've got basic earnings per share. So that's gonna be net income divided by weighted average common shares outstanding. So the income statement again is accrual or recognition, not cash basis. And the very stylized form here is the intuitive revenue Recognized revenue minus recognized expenses equals booked net income. So notice the net income under the accrual here is $12. And I've carried that over to indicate that it would increase or plus up the retained earnings, which is an equity account. So the balance sheet here, unlike the flow income statement, is a stock statement meaning point in time. So there's a balance sheet at the beginning of 2011, and there's a balance sheet that characterizes the exact point in time at the end of the year. And the basic equality on the left-hand side assets need to equal the sum of liabilities and equity. Assets here, we could have cash, or in this case, I've assumed that we sold $100 worth of product, issued the invoice to our customer, but they haven't paid us by the end of the year. So it's an account receivable asset that hasn't converted into cash. So this is the accrual concept in action. We're crediting the asset because we expect to con we expect it to convert into cash shortly. So that $100 in this case might equal 88 in liabilities. These could be payables to our vendors plus the $12 in net income that increases retained earnings. So this very stylized format here, assets equal liabilities plus equity. So then if we go to just to the final two quickly, the third and least popular probably is the statement of owner's equity, statement of changes in owner's equity. This also is a flow measure. So this would be characterizing how the retained earnings changed from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So I just, made this up at the start of the year, assume it was $200. And so this is the shareholders book equity, or we can also call it net asset because it's assets minus liabilities is the equity that's left over. At the beginning of the year, that might've been 200. Then we're gonna plus or add any net income that was accrued under the income statement. After all, that's gonna flow to the owners. So in this case, it's a plus two. If dividends were paid out, those would get subtracted. And then also notice we would have unrealized gains or losses. Remember I said that a key feature of the income statement is it's recognized transactions. Now there may be unrecognized or unrealized gains or losses that do not appear on the income statement. For example, a gain or loss on securities that are held available for sale or derivatives. So they don't show up in the income statement, they don't show up and they won't convert necessarily into the net income. So those those unrealized gains or losses would be captured here after, they ha after all they haven't been realized as transactions and they would influence the change in the return retained earnings account. 
so that we compute to see why the retained earnings is what it is at the end of the year. But again, it's going to be what we could say is a book equity or net assets. Finally, the statement of cash flow, because all of the other three are under the accrual principle, the statement of cash flow is important to us because it describes the actual flow during the year of cash. So here again, like the income statement, it will be over a period of year, in this case, fiscal year 2011. It shows us the starting cash and cash equivalents at the beginning of the year, and then parses that into three basic components, cash from operations, cash from investing, and cash from financing or cash flow from financing. Those three together capture net cash flow during the year, which is going to serve to be the change or delta from the beginning. So the beginning plus or minus the net cash flow gives us the firm's cash and equivalent at the end of the year. So increasingly, this statement is important in conjunction with the income statement, which is accrual-based. This is David Harper, The Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.